Heartfire by Rose Mackey, Book One of Under Violet Suns. Chapter One, Boarding. This had to rank as one of the all-time craziest things she had ever done. Danara stood on the boarding platform for the ship high above the crashing waves, shivering in the cool morning air, reconsidering her life choices. The officer loomed at the foot of the gangway, calling out names from a thin tablet, each colonist stepping into the access tube when called. All around her, Danara could feel the other colonists' anxiety and excitement buzzing against her senses. It was pretty this morning, the spaceport hovering over the ocean, the waves pale pink in the pre-dawn light. The sun was just cresting over the peaks of the nearby mountains and glinting against the flyers and ships, taking off in precise order. She couldn't believe that she was about to move to another planet. Again. She hadn't particularly enjoyed living on Felosia all that much, and balmy temperatures and soft black sand beaches just weren't enough to keep her anymore. Although, she thought wryly, change doesn't always have to be quite as dramatic as moving to a frontier colony on the edge of explored space. Most females just get a new haircut or a tattoo to get over a bad relationship. Danara Pasal, snapped out of her reverie at her name, Danara flushed when she saw the officer watching her expectantly. Healer, came the impatient inquiry again. Danara stepped forward, grabbed her pack and hustled up the gangway. Sorry, Gadek, I was light years away. Mentally, she chastised herself. So much for being a brave, rough-and-ready colonist, if you can't even pay enough attention to board the damned ship when called. She'd be lucky if she wasn't eaten by some alien critter on her first day. Once on board... She continued her mental dialogue like a pendulum, back and forth between crippling anxiety and positive affirmations. She followed the trail of females into the processing area, past utilitarian cream-coloured bulkheads with emergency lights embedded periodically in the deck plates. Her inner monologue came to a screeching halt as she looked down into the cavernous room that opened up at the end of the corridor. The hall was circular, with half-moons of cushioned benches in bright colours bolted to the floor, tearing down to form a large, light-filled amphitheatre. The roof was clear plaz, and she knew once they were off-planet it would show a spectacular view of the stars. Remembering her orientation primer on the Ardrak, she realised the room was one of a series of habitat modules that would be separated from the ship on arrival and provide the basic functional buildings in the community seed of the new colony during Phase 1. Everything about it was designed for slimline efficiency, even if the decor reflected an eclectic style from a century earlier. The Ardrak contained everything necessary to start a life on a mostly habitable, probably won't kill you new planet. Danara took a seat next to a familiar tall, brown-haired female at one of the curved couches. The female reached out and squeezed her hand enthusiastically. Isn't this exciting? I can't believe it's actually happening. It's so nice to meet everyone in person, finally. It feels like we've been in the training phase forever. Her name was Livia, and she was one of the team of multidisciplinary medical personnel assigned to work for her in Medbay. Danara and Livia had spent the past few months in the same online cohort receiving preliminary inductions, psych evaluations, genetic screenings and endless interviews and lectures on everything from ancient agricultural techniques, basic xenobiology, to the principles of construction, everything a young colony needed to get started at the frontier. Danara squeezed Livia's hand in return, squashing down her inner anxiety. It's incredible, isn't it? Two years of tests and inoculations and interviews and we're finally here. Another tall female dropped down onto the sofa on Danara's other side with a sigh. Who'd want to back out anyway? Stay here for another few decades raising my sister's kids? I don't think so. She shuddered dramatically. Nope, I'm in it for my own 300 scree of land and the chance to build something for myself. Livia peered over Danara at the other female. In it just for the dirt, hun. Not for your own handsome hunk of verit male. She wiggled her eyebrows suggestively, and all three burst out laughing. Well, obviously that too. They settled into a comfortable silence as the remaining females filtered in. A familiar older officer with a regal bearing was last to enter, her sleek, form-fitting jumpsuit studded with her badges of rank. She strode past the couches and stood in the basin of the amphitheatre to address the assembled colonists. Welcome, colonists. For those that don't know me, I am Cadet Morale Lien, and I will be the governor for unnamed Colony 29 for Phase 1. We will depart at 0900 and collect the Verit colonists tomorrow from Space Station Amprey. 
From there, we will take the colonial jump gate to Sector 64 and then travel a further two weeks to the colony. She paused, her eyes travelling over the group, feeling ancient in front of their eager anticipation. You have completed your briefing and the psyche vows and are the best Felosia has to offer. Once we leave, you are committed for at least 12 months. 12 months on a colony with zero existing infrastructure. She paused a moment to give everyone a final chance to speak up, but she didn't expect anyone would. The assembled females before her had gone through two years of competitive and gruelling testing to be selected, and several months of invasive medical treatments to make their digestive and immune systems compatible with the local environment on Colony 29. She was deeply proud of every single one of them, the cream of more than two million applicants. Her heart ached for the eagerness, the hope she sensed from them all like little wings brushing against her empathic senses, gossamer thin, but strong enough to carry them far. What we are attempting with this colony has never been tried before. We will be merging two totally different cultures to form a new one, and there will be pitfalls along the way. Be brave ladies, and I hope you all get what you are searching for. Dinara nodded, her head held high. She looked around the room at the other females, their faces shining with pride and anticipation. Unexpectedly, she felt a lump in her throat. After such a long time lost in her own wilderness, she finally felt an overwhelming sense of rightness. She closed her eyes, taking a moment to breathe and control her surging emotions. As she did, her nerves fell away, and she was filled with an excitement that threatened to turn into giddiness. Livia reached over and gripped her hand, squeezing gently, and Dinara saw her eyes sheened with tears. Dinara squeezed back. We've got this. And Livia nodded, returning her attention to the cadet. On the stage, the cadet had finished talking. Regarding the colonists for a moment, she flashed an unexpectedly cheeky grin that softened her dignified manner and instantly made her seem more approachable. She motioned to a female on the side who stepped up to join her, this is Gadek Lenora Patra, responsible for logistics and stores. The Gadek will complete your onboard ship induction and issue your jumpsuits. Use the rest of the day to familiarise yourself with the ship and get to know your fellow colonists. You are going to experience a lot of challenges together. The faster you start harmonising and trusting each other, the more successful the colony will be. She nodded briskly and stepped away from the centre to cede the floor to the Gadek. As the G-Deck talked, listing off emergency procedures and warning klaxons, Dinara let her mind drift. The K-Deck had not overstated the risk for this colony. The design for Colony 29 was wholly unlike any other. Despite being a Gen 4 colony, Colony 29 was the first to be co-sponsored by two planets, Verit and Felosia. Both planets had the same problem, a population that skewed dramatically towards a specific gender. Felosia had a birth rate of approximately 80% female and Verit a similar skew towards male. However, both societies had taken different directions in managing the situation and their values were not necessarily compatible. Dinara turned her attention back to the G-Deck as she started discussing the issue of their jumpsuits. They were beautiful, pale blue, self-adjusting, form-fitting suits, designed with a sophisticated AI which would monitor bodily functions as well as provide access to the ship's systems and automated response to environmental changes, such as a clumsy colonist accidentally tripping out of an airlock. As chief healer, Dinara would have access to those AI systems to monitor the health of the colonists. The G-Deck also held up a silver earcuff and demonstrated installing it. You can change into your suits in your quarters, but put on your cuffs as soon as you collect them. This will give you limited ship integration, such as heads-up display, HUD, maps to your quarters to get you around. Your HUD will display ship alerts and any restricted access signage, so pay attention. There will be no exceptions for people in the wrong areas. The females complied, and at the Gadek's command, the colonists shuffled up to collect their suit and cuff. All right, ladies, you are now free to roam the authorised access areas of the ship and get settled. We have organised a communal dinner at 1800 hours, a traditional Philosian feast. I suggest you enjoy it. Felosian delicacies will be in short supply until the colony establishes trade routes. The Ardrak will shift to night mode at 2200 hours, and you want to be well rested for tomorrow to meet the Verit delegation. There will be plenty of time for carousing when you get settled on your new world. Chapter 2. Nothing was stirring. Dinara lay in a surprisingly comfortable bed, 
impressed that it was an actual mattress and not just a bunk in a communal barracks room. It had been made abundantly clear during their two years of prep that Colony 29 was being set up on a budget and everyone had been repeatedly warned that it would be cheap and cheerful. It was going to be a new model in a lot of ways. A cheaper fit-out, more independence, co-sponsoring. Oh yeah, and the first colony designed specifically for matchmaking. Lots of firsts, lots of things to go wrong. With all the warnings, she had expected communal bunk rooms and scratchy blankets. Instead, each colonist had been given a cosy apartment with a real bedroom and a small combined kitchen and a living room with an office nook. Each unit even had an old-fashioned bathroom, complete with a retro sonic shower. Like most of the ship compartments, the residential quarters would detach from the Ardrak central ring on landing and would be used as the initial housing units. Despite the plush bed, Danara could not sleep. She restlessly shifted, trying to find a comfortable spot, fluffing and punching her pillow into different positions. Her mind kept drifting back to the dinner. It had been nice, also unexpected. Years of pursuing her genetics research and then her disastrous off-world marriage had left her disengaged from close friends. It was refreshing to have the community of females. While their bonds had been formed remotely, through their online lectures, they were real and had the potential to deepen into true friendships. Danara had arrived at the mess hall just before the welcome feast, and her empathic senses had been in overdrive with all of the emotions swirling from the other females. Excitement, fear, sadness at friends left behind, hope, anxiety, all of it feeding on itself in a churning stew that left her wanting to vomit. Like the rest of the Ardrak, the mess hall was decorated in a style from the early 3900S, which meant lots of light and bright primary colours. It was adorably vintage, and she was beginning to think that she was actually going to enjoy living here. A large buffet table was set in the alcove in front of the massive 180-degree viewing window. Outside, Danara could see the blurred stars of travelling through normal space at speed. She hustled past it, the sight always unnerving to her. As the other Philosian colonists arrived, the females set to the traditional Philosian foods of flatbreads topped with vegetables and drank Luzi, a warm fermented berry distillation, while they swapped histories, each of them slowly relaxing into a warm fuzziness. The females in the colony were bright, strong and determined, each a specialist in her field. She was proud to be among them, even if she still had to pinch herself on occasion to believe it. She'd been particularly happy to see Fila Maru in the group. They had gone to school together and had been thick as thieves until their respective careers had taken them in different directions. When she had seen Fila's name on the colony listing, she had hoped that it was the same person. Fila had screeched out a welcome when she saw her, hauling Danara into an enthusiastic bear hug. They instantly clicked into their old friendship, the years falling away with each glass of Lucy. It made her a little less apprehensive about the change, knowing that Fila was there too. Fila was totally fearless, and more than a little wicked. Her emotions a warm blaze to Danara's harmonic senses, made up of a fiery temper, fierce compassion and humour that would certainly liven up the experience. Direct to the point of rudeness, Fila hadn't pulled any punches in her interrogation of her. I was absolutely astounded to see your name on the list. I actually did some snooping to see if it was really you. Oh. Danara kept her face deliberately neutral. I was sure that I'd heard you had mated. Some off-worlder. Yeah, it didn't work out. Danara took a deep swig of her Lucy, feeling the burn as it rolled down her throat. She had expected this sooner or later, just not on the first night. She supposed it was inevitable. Her mating to Amun had been big news. They'd even had a bridal feature in the interstellar edition of People Brides. Some Alliance delegate's son from Svoboda, wasn't it? Dinara nodded again. Brave marrying a Svobodan. I saw the pictures of your gown, a Dling original. It was stunning. Fila barreled on, oblivious to Dinara's discomfort. So what gives? Dinara shrugged. Like I said, it didn't work out. When the three-year contract was up, I chose not to renew. She had given up her professorship at the University of Svoboda and hightailed it back home to Felosia before her asshole ex-husband or his powerful family could stop her. Finally registering her emotional resonance, Fila regarded her solemnly. Some things aren't meant to be. She reached over and wrapped an arm around her shoulder. Off-world marriages can be hard. Danara nodded again. She had been young and incredibly naive. 
Swept up in the glamour of dating a moon, she had failed to notice the veritable field of red flags. Her mother and sister had both tried to warn her that the Svobodan culture was very different from Felosia. Their females led highly restricted lives. But Amun had been so convincing, so worldly. He knew she was pursuing her research. He had said he'd loved her mind. They had agreed to wait for children. All that changed when she moved to Svoboda. Being married to Amun had been a slow suffocation, gradually chipping away at her sense of self and independence until she was a shell of the female she had been just a couple of years earlier. Not for the first time, she thanked the goddess that Philosian biology had meant that she could not have children at the time. If she had fallen pregnant, there would have been no escape. It had taken two years of support from her mother and sister before she had clawed back her sense of self. As the years passed, she had begun to question whether she would ever be ready to take on the world again. When the option to join the colony had arrived, she decided to take a leap, to try once more to recapture her dreams, pursue her research again. Dinara sniffled and took another swig. I guess I haven't learned my lesson. Here I am heading to another planet to start over again. This is different. There's so much support here and no pressure to mate. What's the worst that can happen? We have an adventure, have a fling with a hot alien dude and come out of it rich females with our own land on a growing colony world. Fila patted her cheek gently. Don't worry, Dinara, I've got your back. If some Verit Creven so much as looks at you wrong, I'll dump him on his ass before he can blink. Swatting her away, Dinara erupted in laughter. I'm not the same person I was last time. If some Creven tries to hurt me this time, I'll beat him black and blue myself. Dinara felt the rightness of the statement settle into the pit of her stomach. She would never allow herself to be vulnerable like that again. Snuggling deeper into her covers, her mind drifted to the male Verit delegation. As a healer, she had access to their medical files and had reviewed them in detail. Dinara was not above a little scrutinization of their pictures and bios for personal interest, but it hadn't been all that successful. She needed to meet them herself to really get a sense of them. She wasn't in the market for a partner just now, wasn't sure if she would ever be ready to tie herself to a male again. She was here for her research. Dinara snorted at herself mentally. Yeah, even she wasn't buying what she was selling. Chapter 1. First Meeting. Letter from Office of the Matriarch Ray to First Warrior Lucius de Dathalka Clan. Lucius, you are hereby ordered to take command of the warriors of the Dathalka Clan that have been selected for the first wave of Colony 29. You will collect the warriors in the attached list and present yourself to Mamon Frey seven solar days hence at the Matriarch Citadel for onward travel to Space Station Ampre, where a ship will rendezvous with you and transport you to the colony. You will join a delegation of females from the planet Felosia and present yourselves to them for selection as an appropriate mate. Jointly, your brothers and the Felosians will form the first wave of the new colony and prepare the site and infrastructure for future expansion. You will officially report to Prime Brown under Felosian governorship. Felosia will administer and operate the colony during the initial phases. One of their generals, Cadet Moral Lien, has been assigned as colonial governor. Fear not, you will not be without the blessings of the goddess in your travels. Mamon Frey will travel with you. While she will have no official designation in the colony leadership, you remain Verit and will follow her commands to the letter. The opportunity afforded to you and your clan brothers is unique and will be trial for the ongoing mode of operation of the colony. It is entrusted to you and the Dathalka clan to demonstrate that this experiment will work. As a reminder of your obligations to Verit and to the matriarchy, we will welcome your younger brothers Valk and Tlui to stay with us at the matriarch citadel for as long as we deem necessary. They will be held accountable for your ongoing obedience. The hopes of your brothers across Verit go with you. End transmission. Personal note appended to transmission. Lucius, don't screw this up. The Matriarch does not wish for more bloodshed but cannot have you wandering the universe uncontrolled. The Convocation would have her head and her crown along with it. You have a chance of a life that your father and I could not have dreamed of. Make it work for all of us. Don't make me witness the punishment or execution of your brothers. Varin Day, first male of Verit. Dinara surreptitiously dabbed her sweaty palms on the thighs of her jumpsuit as they walked through the corridors, heart pounding with nerves. Her HUD displayed a gentle ping and an amber warning signal for the biometric readouts of the Felosian delegation, denoting elevated respiration and heart rate. 
Thanks for stating the obvious, HUD. They were all nervous. They were about to meet the Verit delegation for the first time. Although if this meeting went well, there hopefully would be more instances of increased heart rate and respiration. Danara made a mental note to decrease the sensitivity of the jumpsuit monitors. As a healer, it was essential that she monitor the health of the delegation at all times. But she did not need to get an amber alert every time her sisters got nervous or excited, especially with the prospective matings. Her train of thought had her struggling to contain a snigger and drawing odd looks from her sisters as they sensed her amusement. The cadet held up her hand, and the Philosian stopped before the entrance to the amphitheatre, awaiting her final words of advice. Before we go in, I warn you all, these males are not Philosian. Do not expect them to behave as such. As you all know, their home colonies have few females. It is likely that many of these males have had only limited experience in talking with those of our gender. Try not to scare them too much at this first meeting. The last was said with a wry grin. This is purely an initial meet and greet. You will have ample opportunities to get to know them on the colony, so let's go easy on the boys for a bit. As they awaited entry, Danara took in her sisters a final time. Each of them was attired in standard Felotian space jumpsuits, the blue thermo fabric covering everything from the high neck down, with low slung belts attached at waist and thigh, sporting a range of tools and weaponry appropriate to their occupations. Each wore knee-high dark grey boots, both flexible and equipped with gravity locks. The effect was very becoming and a little intimidating. After what felt like an eternity, although it had probably only been a couple of seconds, the atrium pod doors swished open and they entered. Lucius paced the wide open space at the bottom of the amphitheatre, the anger churning in his stomach an old aged thing, a beast he had long ago befriended and rode to battle, a dark stranger within with banked, smouldering rage. As he circled the wide hall, he realised too late that he had come into the Mammon's line of sight. She smiled at him, her viciousness hidden behind her perfect mask of civility. Be still, first warrior. A lady arrives when she wishes to. Lucius bowed to her politely, his face an expressionless mask. He was well practised at keeping his opinions to himself. He couldn't have cared less if the females kept them waiting for years. He had no intention of binding himself to any female, but his brothers were brimming with excitement at the opportunity to meet the Philotians. He looked to the Prime standing beside his mate, who misguidedly tried to reassure him. I imagine they are as anxious to meet our boys as we are to meet them. I have heard there is less than one male for every ten females in their colony. They must be starved for male company. Lucius nodded. He had read the briefing papers, but still wondered just how so many females survived without males. He could not imagine how they could cope with the harsh realities of a colony living without the males to lift and carry for them. The Verit Maman would never go anywhere without a coterie of male workers. Belatedly realising that a response was required, he spoke, True, but if they don't get here soon, the boys are going to begin chewing through the chairs. They turned together to look at the group of huge males, hunched seated on the absurd, tiny, colourful benches covered in garish cushions. They were a motley lot, each wearing his manhood skins and furs, displaying their achievements in skills and education as badges and pins on their garments, over black AI thermo jumpsuits. Each tall, their hair metallic white, gold, iron or silver, and skin ranging the colour spectrum, they were fine specimens, the best the Dathalka clan could offer. At the sound of the doors sliding open, Lucius turned to watch the ladies of Philosian Colony stride into the room and begin the descent down the shallow steps to the amphitheatre stage where he waited. He examined them in a detached manner as he heard the collective intake of breath, thirty males inhaling in a rush at once. He turned to his males, who appeared to have all managed to cluster behind him, quite a feat for more than two dozen giant warriors, and gestured for them to step forward to present themselves to the females for inspection. He motioned again to no avail. Every single one of his boys was drinking in the view of the ladies as they walked up the aisle between the sofas to greet them. Raising his eyes in prayer to the goddess, he called out, Verit warriors, attend. As one, as if choreographed, they rose from their seats moving to form a V behind him, standing in the traditional attention position, feet apart, and arms hanging loosely by their sides, head held high. He thought he heard muffled laughter covered briefly by coughing from the females, but was sure that was incorrect. Turning back to the ladies, 
They stopped several feet from him and Brown on the edge of the illuminated circle on the floor detonating the stage boundary. Before the Prime could offer the traditional greeting, their leader stepped forward into the centre of the stage. An elegant female, she gave off a distinctly no-nonsense vibe. She was tall and lithe, her short silver hair cropped close to her head, her skin of darkest blood red, her eyes an unusual piercing yellow. She wore the sensible pale blue jumpsuit that seemed to be Felosian standard issue. He could see the nano-threads and sensor crystals embedded along the bodice and trim. Despite himself, he was intrigued. They were not at all what he had expected, although he admitted to himself that he had not given the actual females he had been brought to meet much thought at all. He had been too furious about being ordered to present himself for mating, like he was a prized stud to be sent to market, bargained off for a barrel of wine or fancy cloth. His Dathalka brothers had been rife with speculation about their potential mates, concocting increasingly more outlandish dream scenarios of the females. Lucius had held himself apart. He understood their excitement, the shining kernel of hope this opportunity had given them after decades of despair that nothing would ever change. He would not steal their nascent joy, would not poison it with his fear and bitterness. Greetings to you from the Felosian colonists. I am Kadek Morale, Governor of Colony 29. She gave a short little head bob and stepped back. Brune paused, taken aback by her matter-of-fact manner, her lack of airs, and Lucius saw him decide to forego the traditional bow and hand kiss in this instance. Greetings, Lady Morale. I am Prime Brune Frey, first male of the colonists of Verit transferring to Colony 29. We welcome you to our company. If I may present my lady, Maman Frey. He indicated his mate, who stepped forward gracefully and curtsied, before smiling up at the Kadek, towering more than a foot above her. Kadek Morale, I am delighted to meet you. Her voice was saccharine, all bubbly charm. And doubly delighted to meet your charming... Her eyes skimmed over the crowd of ladies behind the Kadek. Females. Lucius hissed under his breath, hoping that the Felosians did not understand enough of Verit culture to pick up on the subtle insult the Maman had delivered. By not referring to them as ladies or mamans, she had declared them as other and therefore not worthy of respect. We are happy you could take the time for this informal introduction before our briefings begin tomorrow. However, we shall keep it short, as I am sure you will wish to rest and refresh after your journey. The last was said with a motherly smile which did not meet her eyes. The Kidek raised an eyebrow. Thank you for your consideration. However, I assure you my ladies are quite rested. We have had ample time to relax after boarding. We females of Felosia are made of stern stuff. The last was said with a laugh, which was echoed in chuckles by her females. Lucius settled his edged temper. It seemed that the Kadek was not taken in by the Mamon's pleasant exterior. That was good. Lucius had heard that the females of Felosia were skilled at discerning people's true motivations. They would need it to deal with the lethal nest of the Mamon convocation. He also noted that while the Kadek had glanced at the Mamon's attire, the Kadek deliberately did not comment at the Mamon's impractical white sheath. Lucius had been horrified when he'd seen what the Mamon was wearing. Why in the name of the goddess was she not wearing a jumpsuit? Accidents happened in space, and in that outfit she'd be dead in seconds if there was a breach. It had made him instantly suspicious. The Mamon were more likely to wear armour than dainty dresses, and were not in the habit of placing themselves at risk in any way. It spoke to a deeper agenda. Initially, he had been worried that the ladies from Felosia would think them uncivilised imbeciles, lacking in basic technology or understanding of spacefaring protocols, unable to provide basic safety equipment for their precious females. He had conveyed his sentiments to the Maman, who had icily informed him that he had no say over her choice of attire and that he should keep his opinions to himself. Belatedly, he had realised that perhaps that was the point of the attire, Venomous creatures often camouflaged as weaker ones, in order to lure in prey. The cadet returned her attention to the Prime and continued, Perhaps if I introduce my senior staff to you, we can leave the others to introduce themselves. The Prime nodded in agreement, clearly relieved at the normalcy of a female taking charge. Lucius felt for him. He would not have stood in the Prime's position for a year's worth of credits. His brothers of Verit so badly needed this new colony to work. The Kadek motioned forward several of her team. A female with beautiful midnight skin and unusual short dark red hair, like the heart of a ruby, stepped to the fore, her carriage erect. Something about her stance suggested pent-up energy, 
and her golden eyes were constantly moving, assessing her surroundings and the males. Lucius noted that her belt held several weapons. This is Gadex Raya Rattan, head of our security and defence in the group. There was a muttering from his men, which was quickly silenced as he turned his glare over the group. He had advised them that the Felotian delegation included martial roles, but they had not believed him. Interstellar Scuttlebutt had generally stereotyped Felosians as a gentle race. It was an uncomfortable reminder to many of the boys of their own vicious Verit females. The Gidek boldly met his gaze when he turned around again. I shall enjoy getting to know you and look forward to an exchange of skills at the earliest opportunity. With a brief bob of her head she stepped back and another was motioned forward. Lucius's blood heated in his veins as soon as he saw her, instant attraction a punch in his gut. She was coloured in a palette of the sun, with smooth caramel skin and light champagne eyes. Unlike her companions, she was short, just over five feet in height, with waves of pale yellow hair that looked ethereal against her blue jumpsuit. Where her companions were tended towards the lithe and muscular, she was petite, all curves and lush roundness. He was too far away to catch her scent, but he could smell the immediate interest in many of his boys, and he resisted the urge to bare his fangs in challenge at them. Never had he felt such an instant attraction to a female. The dark stranger within him demanded that he step forward, present himself to her, insist that she see him. This is Danara Pasal, chief healer. Danara offered a small professional smile before stepping back into the line. The inoculations you receive to enhance your digestive and immune systems to accept local food proteins from Colony 29 were thanks to Danara's brilliant work. His boys nodded again, many less enthusiastically. Adjusting one's digestive system was not a pleasant experience, even with modern medicine. Lucius's interest sharpened again, and he clenched his muscles against the urge to step forward and demand that she notice him. Shocked by the train of his own thoughts, he held himself in a taloned grip. Despite the purpose of the colony, he had not seriously entertained the concept of a mate. The last thing he wanted was to leash himself to the whim of some scheming female, no matter how pretty or intelligent. He was empty inside, hollow, a bowl scraped clean of soft feelings. Until this moment, he would have sworn that he did not have the capacity to feel anything gentle for the female gender, his awareness of their brutality carved into his skin and bones over a lifetime of leading warriors to enact their will. Instantly suspicious of his own reaction, he placed a chokehold on his surging feelings. He would follow orders and protect his clan brothers. Nothing more. Before the cadet could introduce the next female in line, she stepped forward herself and flashed a dazzling white smile at the males, tossing dark green hair. I am Gadek Fila Maru, specialist engineer, horticulture and flora technology, and I am just delighted to meet you all. This last was said as she struck a pose that could only be described as suggestive, with her shoulders back, head held high, long legs and slim physique shown to good advantage. The cadet shook her head, as she took in the stunned looks on the males. That is enough, Fila. With a jerk of her head, she motioned for Fila to return to the others. And finally, this is Gadek Lenora Patra, who is responsible for logistics and stores. The final female nodded formally and smiled politely before stepping back into the line behind the Kadek. Like her fellow Philosians, Lenora's eyes seemed to hold an inner fire, a warm honey colour. Her hair was jet black, wrapped in a tight bun, her skin shining pale. Her introductions completed, the Kedek looked expectantly to the prime. Ahem, uh -huh, yes, well. He turned to look at his warriors and motioned for several of them to step forward. He turned to his left and clasped his hand on Lucius's shoulder. This is Lucius D, first warrior of the Dathalka clan, leader of the warriors on the colony. Lucius offered a polite, precise bow, first warrior to Maman. Next up was a lean young man, a rising star in the ranks, but still young enough to smile cockily, puffing his chest out to better display his manhood furs and bright badges of rank. He eagerly took in the ladies before him with a charming grin. Odrin de Hela. He swept into a bow and stepped forward to take the cadet's hand. There was an awkward moment when she simply stared at his outstretched palm in incomprehension before she realised his intent. With slow grace she offered him her hand, and watched with fascination as he touched his lips to her skin, before quickly shuffling back into the group of males behind him. Two more males stepped forward, brothers in their identical manners and looks. 
They were every inch the traditional Varician males with their pale silver hair, chiselled faces and layers of furs over black jumpsuits. They introduced themselves as Lucan Day and Petra Day, habitation and colony planners. They were also an ongoing pain in Lucius's ass. They were brilliant but had a tendency to go off plan if they felt it necessary, or if they were bored. In this instance, he just felt sorry for them. Gone was their usual brash manner. They looked just as unsure as all the other boys, so desperate to make a good impression and confused by the friendly, straightforward manner of the females. The cadet turned around to give her girls a quelling look as she heard a susurration of mutters and hushed comments. Lucan and Petra looked at each other in panic. Had they somehow inadvertently offended the females so soon? Lucius came to their rescue. Is there a problem, Lady Morale? The cadet smiled at him. No, warrior, they simply wonder if you are all related. While it is obvious that Lucan and Petra here are, we are confused by the use of a shared surname and wonder at the genetic diversity of a group with so many related members. Lucius nodded in understanding. I see the confusion. However, unlike Philosian culture, our last nominator signifies rank, not family. Only Lucan and Petra are related. The rest of the males in our group are unrelated. D signifies at least a Philosian level 3 equivalent or above seniority. The Kadek nodded her thanks for the explanation. Many thanks. I believe that information was in our briefing pack. Apparently some of my ladies require further study time. The last was said with a smile, which was returned by the two males before her. Although one assumes that the members of your delegation would be most happy to tutor the ladies, should the opportunity arise. In sync, the males flashed dazzling smiles full of dimples, nodded and bowed again before beating a hasty retreat into line. The last to step forward was a grizzled older male, his rugged face bearing signs of time spent in harsh weather and outdoors. Broken D Senior Technical Specialist. He stepped back into line without acknowledging any of the ladies, to the cadet's raised eyebrow. There was another awkward pause before the prime roused himself. Let's avail ourselves of some refreshments. The maman has organised some fresh fruits and nuts for us to enjoy, a traditional verit delicacy. Let us savour this moment, as I'm sure once we reach Colony 29, recreation time shall be rare for a while. Prime Frey extended his hand to his mate, who beamed again, clearly glad about this praise before she pressed a series of buttons on the screen of her wristband, which summoned several bots carrying platters. As the group broke up, the key deck moved to stand next to the Prime, watching the Verit and Philosian delegations eyeing each other from their respective sides of the room. She could feel the agitation emanating from the Prime. After a few moments of standing in silence, she ventured, You seem disturbed, Prime. You were most silent during the introductions. Is there some issue that I can assist you with? Brown turned to look at her, his face flushed. It is nothing you need concern yourself with, my lady. Clearly it is if you are so upset about it. Also, my title is Kadek, not Lady. I would prefer you use it when we are in a formal setting. She wondered if she should summon Danara, as impossibly his face seemed to flush further, turning a fascinating deep pink, and his emotional state became more distressed, like angry bees to her senses. My apologies, my lul, Kadek. I did not mean to disturb you. I am not upset, it is just that... Well, he waved his hands in the air as if attempting to gesture his ideas, an effect that was somewhat comical to the cadet, as his hands appeared as big as bear paws to her. We knew that there were some cultural and biological differences, but our maman convocation assured us that we would be compatible. But you are very different from our females. I suspect that the researchers have underestimated the adjustment required to integrate our cultures. He paused. My boys are good strong warriors honestly looking for a new life and mates. They have many professional and personal achievements, survived battles. But I wonder how many of them will be brave enough to approach one of your females. The cadet laughed outright, a deep husky sound, and the prime stiffened in affront and embarrassment. I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at your concern. There will undoubtedly be issues to overcome. I laugh because you underestimate my girls. She flicked a hand. Take a look. She pointed to where Fila had approached the astonishing identical male twins, unheard of on Felosia, and was deep in conversation with them while the others looked on in jealousy and amazement. She also noted the large warrior, Lucius, was decidedly interested in Danara. There wasn't a Felosian in the room that had missed his spike of attraction. My Felosians are not scared. 
Many have waited their lives for a chance to meet a mate and build a life. They will not give up this opportunity because your boys are a little shy. With that, she patted him on the shoulder and wandered off to encourage her girls to mingle. Danara stood next to Fila, grabbing a handful of nuts from the platters as they circled on their floating bots. That was awesome. I can't believe you did that. Did you feel how amazed they were when you just stepped forward? Fila grinned and winked at her. I figure we've got one chance at first impressions, so let's get started right. They may as well know that we aren't going to shrink back. I wish I had your confidence. Seriously, how many awards do you have again? You created the entire medical program here. You're incredible. And don't tell me you didn't feel their interest in you. Apparently the Verit male fantasy is petite and curvy. Danara looked uncertain. After a lifetime of being the short, stocky one among the vibrant elegance of Felosia, it had been a shock to feel the Verit male's keen interest. Danara, the thing about confidence is that sometimes you have to just jump in and the confidence will come. Just go up and talk to one of them. Danara looked around critically. Which one? They are huge. I'd feel like a mushroom around them all. A mushroom with killer boobs. They both paused a moment to consider the image before they shared a laugh. Feel a motion to the lead warrior that had introduced himself. What about him? He seemed very interested. Danara examined the gorgeous Verit male. Like his brothers, he was huge with distinct metallic colouring and chiselled features. Despite sharing a similar human template genetic model, he would never be mistaken for a Philosian male. Burnished pale gold skin and long bronze hair braided back from his face, showing off his sharp features and intense shadowed blue eyes. She noted fine silver scars tracing over his neck shimmering in the light, and a tattoo of a snarling wolf-like creature curved up his temple to his eyebrow. Within him she sensed a hard, feral edge that none of the others had. There was no denying that he attracted her. He was very self-contained, but his appreciation of her had been a white-hot flash in his emotions. When he moved, it was with an economy of motion that was distinctly feline. He was a sharpened blade that would slice her emotions to ribbons. Are you insane? Dinara hissed. I mean, he has cheekbones you could cut silk on and he's fit as the goddess made him, but he's the head warrior. He has a knife, no, two knives on his belt. And look at what he is wearing. Goddess incarnate. Is that animal fur and leather? So... You're looking at his belt, then. Fila ducked Danara's good-natured whack. It's cultural, and they are all wearing it, so dust off your interstellar diplomacy and hide your disgust at the wearing of dead megafauna. Speaking of stupid sartorial choices, what about ones that could get a body killed? Why was that silly female not wearing a jumpsuit? Danara pulled a face, her eyes drifting back to the giant first warrior, tracing the strong column of his neck. He was certainly good-looking in a brooding I-could-break-you-with-my-pinky way. At that instant he looked up, his gaze capturing hers. It was shockingly intimate, his searing emotions a hair's breadth away if she wanted to reach out, and she felt the connection down to the bottom of her toes curling in her gravity boots. Channeling feeler, she boldly allowed her gaze to travel over his features and frame, until it snagged on the dead creature. She really hated the fur. She turned away shuddering, thinking about skinning some poor xenomorph and parading about in it. Besides, so do you. What? Danara was broken from her train of thought by Fila's non sequitur. You have laser knives too, Danara huffed, then fended Fila off as she made to grab the device off of her belt before she held it up between them and waved it under Fila's nose. This is a laser scalpel, a precision medical instrument for life-saving purposes, not to just go stabby-stabby at some poor animal with. Fila laughed as she avoided Danara's jabbing with the inactive device. I mean, we have lasers and spaceships. Why the hell is he carrying around a giant sword? An amused voice interrupted from behind them. I never realised Philosian females were so feral. Why are you threatening your colleague with a scalpel? A knife would be more efficient. Both females turned to see the young healer standing behind them. Danara again flushed red. I, um... I know we introduced ourselves earlier, but it was a bit of a blur... My name again is Odrin, and I am the Verit healer assigned to lead the labs on the colony. Did you say you were Danara Passal? You are the same healer Passal that wrote the treatise on genetic and immune therapy adjustments for interstellar colonisation and inhospitable biomes. Yes, actually, did you read it? Indeed, and I participated in the streamed lecture session that you gave to the University of Svoboda. 
Absolutely fascinating. I was very excited when I saw your name listed and realised who you might be. My own research on developing crops that can be successfully transplanted to new colony worlds without disrupting the local ecology is based on several of the theories in your paper. I would very much like the opportunity to work with you on them. Dinara beamed. Absolutely, I would love to collaborate. Have you read my follow-up paper on... Fila cut in. I can see your dilemma is resolved here, Dinara, so I think I will go find someone of my own to converse with. She flipped her long green hair and boldly crossed the invisible line in the room dividing the groups to approach the charming twins. So boys, can you please explain to me the significance of wearing megafauna skin? Both twins flashed her identical white smiles with just a hint of fang. Certainly, my lady, you see. Slowly, following Odrin and Fila's examples, the groups began to mingle, except Lucius, who stood observing Dinara and Odrin. While he admired Odrin's boldness in approaching a female first, he preferred to learn his opposition's habits before engaging. He had never felt such an instinctive, immediate reaction to a female. Everything in him told him to be wary, but he couldn't help being drawn to her. He reasoned it wouldn't hurt to learn everything he could about the intriguing Gila Pasal. Forewarned is forearmed. Later that night, Fry pulled back the bedsheets aggressively, contemplating her dissatisfaction with the initial meeting. As she settled into bed, she observed the cabin. Having inspected the others in the delegation, she was aware that it was more than triple the size of even the largest of the others, which mollified her slightly. But it did not make up for the ancient decor and substandard quality of the soft furnishings. She was a maman and deserved the best that could be provided. Brune stood before an opening in the bulkhead, divesting himself of his furs and belts down to his jumpsuit. How she detested that thing. Plain black and functional, and to be worn at all times in space when not taking care of ablutions, she had refused to wear it. A maman never blended in. Her wardrobe was armour. Brun spoke over his shoulder to her. I thought it went well tonight. They met, had an opportunity to discuss, no one offended anyone. It went better than we could have hoped for. Fry was shocked. She had selected Brown for his bloodline, ambition and willingness to follow her lead, not his intelligence, but still... She had expected better than this from him. Those females are not at all what we expected. They were so casual with the males, so free in their presence. It is concerning. Too much familiarity and males will forget who and what we are. Brune paused, his back still to her. I would have thought you liked them, especially the Kadek. The Mammon Convocation has always sought strong females, and these Philosians seem able to hold their own. Frey sat up in bed and stared stonily at him. Do not presume to tell me or the Mammon Convocation what we look for, Brune. Her voice was a whip. The balance between the genders is delicate. Each has their assigned role, which work in harmony for the betterment of the community. I will not allow these females to disrupt that balance or contaminate our males with strange ideas. Brune held up his hands placatingly. Yes, yes, I know. I wasn't questioning the Convocation's authority. But the Convocation conceded that a Mammon would not be in charge here, only an observer. We must find a way to work with these Philosians and merge our visions of the future, or the colony will fail. No one wants a repeat of Liberty Colony. He climbed into bed beside her and leaned over to kiss her as she turned away. And another thing, he said, his voice firm. You must wear your jumpsuit tomorrow. No, it is not safe for you to travel in space without it, he continued implacably. Your safety is my highest responsibility, I must insist. I said no, Brune. My decision is final. She turned on her side away from him, fluffing her pillow. She did not owe him any explanations for her behaviour. Don't think I don't know what you are doing. You want them to think you weak and foolish, but I will not allow some plot or machination to place you in harm's way. She stiffened against him, and he realised that he danced the knife's edge of her anger. It is not your place to allow me anything, Prime. I will do as I will and you will follow my command. This is as the goddess will it. The prime was undeterred. I had a special one made for you. In gold. She paused. Really? Really, I know you, my lady. Surely we can compromise between your desired strategy and your safety. She turned to peer at him as he kissed the curve of her neck. Very well, mate. I shall inspect it in the morning and make my decision. She graced him with a smile and allowed him to kiss her cheek before rolling over again. Restlessly, she shuffled, trying to get comfortable. I know this colony is on a budget, but they could have sprung a little for better pillows. 
Brune sighed and closed his eyes. Chapter 4. Stowaway. The next morning the Kadex sat in her office poring over the colony plans a final time. They had exited the FTL jump gate. There was a bare two weeks left before the colonists would begin the last approach to the new colony, and she had a significant volume of work to get through. Excuse me, ma'am, if I could have a moment of your time, please. An earnest young male hovered outside the cadet's office. Certainly, how may I assist you? The cadet frowned. She had reviewed the colony personnel files extensively, but had never been very good with names. Petrodi, isn't it, from Colony Administration? The young Petrodi smiled, pleased that she knew his name. He had an open face and was clearly excited and anxious in equal measures. Yes, ma'am. He bobbed a polite bow, causing morale to hide a smile. I have been reviewing the manifests, and it looks like the colonial delegation is intended to be 66 individuals, is that correct? She nodded, wondering where this was going. There appears to be a discrepancy in the ship manifests, as we are currently listed as 68 humanoid inhabitants. What? The cadet took the offered data pad and sure enough the current ship listings showed 68 active humanoid life signatures. Display statistics on current inhabitants. The data pad obediently began displaying health stats on the various ship personnel. It lists 33 female passengers when I understood that there should only be 31. 30 from Felosia plus your maman. Is there any chance that you could have had stowaways on your shuttle? Negative. Each of us has gone through rigorous genetic screening to ensure the viability of our new colony, as well as months of inoculations and genetic therapies, to ensure there will be no rejection of the local flora, fauna or other environmental factors. Anyone stowing away could be in serious danger. The Kadek accessed her HUD and contacted the Prime, who answered without visual. Excuse the interruption, Prime. Have you approved any additional personnel to accompany us? Negative, any additional passengers would be in danger without the environmental adjustment therapies. Do we have a stowaway? It appears so. Petra has indicated that we have two additional females on board. I suggest that we call an emergency all-personnel meeting in the mess hall. We can do a roll call to identify who the additional persons are, and if they do not attend the all-personnel call, we can use the ship's internal sensors to locate them. We must do it immediately. We can't have people running about causing contamination if they haven't been cleared. There is also the risk of sabotage. Agreed. Issue the call, and we will meet you in the mess hall. The Kadek cut the comms and within a few taps, the ship's internal communications began broadcasting an all-personnel emergency meeting announcement, as well as flashing alerts on everyone's HUDs. As the Kadek and Petra marched towards the mess hall, the Kadek noted Petra's serious face and anxious energy increasing. Is there another problem, Petra de? Is there something you would like to tell me? He shook his head, but could not keep a nagging suspicion from his mind. Surely the Maman convocation would not have been so stupid. They hastened along the curving corridors to the mess hall, arriving to find personnel from all over the ship running towards them and demanding answers. What's happening? What's going on? Does anyone know what is happening? It took less than three minutes for all the personnel to assemble. Without preamble, the cadet stepped forward. Everyone, please stand on the left-hand side of the room. I will call your names. When called, move to the centre of the room for retina verification scanning then proceed to the right-hand side of the room once confirmed. No one may leave for any reason until I advise otherwise. We may have multiple stowaways on board. There was a susurration from the assembled personnel. Let's get cracking. I will do myself first. She scanned herself using the data pad, and a melodic computerized voice responded immediately with Kadek Maralien, Falosia. Next, she scanned the Prime, and the Maman who had appeared with the rest of the crew. The Mammon approached to be scanned in frigid silence and went to stand as far from him as she could while complying with the cadet's directions. One by one, the various personnel from the delegations were scanned and moved to the right of the mess hall. As the numbers of unchecked personnel dwindled, the Mammon showed increasing signs of agitation and began slowly moving herself through the crowd towards the entry hatch. She had assumed her movements were unnoticed until a hand clamped down on her forearm. Turning around to deliver a blistering reprimand to the individual that had dared to lay hands on her person, it died on her lips as she looked into her mate's glacial blue eyes. Stay a while, my lady. We wouldn't want you to get caught up in the search for stowaways and be harmed. They may be violent during their apprehension, he hissed at her, his eyes coldly furious. 
Aware of their growing audience, she swallowed her initial scathing response. Thank you for your care, mate. But of course, I think only of your safety and health. He wrapped her arm through his and gently but inexorably guided her back to the centre of the room. They reached the centre of the hall as the cadet completed the scan on the final member of the official team. All right, all members of the official delegation are present here in this room, as verified by medical scanning. That means that anyone picked up by the internal scanners are stowaways. She raised her voice. Computer, access internal sensors, scan for internal life signs outside of the mess hall. The pleasant female voice of the computer responded with, Two life signs detected. Location. Personnel quarters AB346. Who is assigned to those quarters? Maman and Prime Freybron. All eyes turned to the Prime, who coughed nervously. I can assure you all that I have not brought any additional personnel with our delegation, and certainly not any unauthorised personnel. The cadet nodded. No one is suggesting that, Prime. Her voice was soothing. Lucius D., please take a delegation of security personnel and apprehend the stowaways. Have them brought to my office immediately. The Prime and I will meet you there. Gadek Rattan, keep everyone else here until the stowaways have been apprehended. Lucius nodded and indicated for a Philosian security officer to follow him, in addition to the young security guard Tarlak Day. At the Gadek's raised eyebrow, he cleared his throat self-consciously. Petra Day has informed me that the stowaways are female. We may need some female assistance. If they are from Verit, Verit males are strongly conditioned not to touch a female without her permission. She nodded in response. Videk Zira, go with Lucius. The Kadek turned to the assembled personnel awaiting her commands. Everyone take a break and get comfy. You should be back at your duties within the hour. Prime, Maman, if you would come with me. They followed the Kadek from the room. As they walked, he hissed quietly at her. This had better not be what I think it is. Careful to keep his voice low so that the cadet would not hear. The maman turned wide, innocent, eyes upon her mate. Whatever do you mean, dear? I assure you that I don't know. Her eyes narrowed. However, even if I did know what you were referring to, it is none of your business what I choose to do, she hissed, casting furtive glances at the cadet's back as they walked. They continued down the corridors in silence, glaring at each other, and entered the cadet's offices to await Lucius's return. Lucius and his team crept along the corridor. Overlaid on his vision was a plan of the apartment, red flashing dots indicating the stowaways and his team. His senses were on full alert for any change in the environment. Both stowaways seemed to be stationary in the living area of the Prime's quarters. I think we should access the quarters from both the living area and the emergency access in the rear bedroom. V-Deck, would you take the bedroom access? I will take the living room, since it is likely these are Verit citizens, and they will respond more favourably to Verit security. The V-Deck nodded in response to the logic. Tarlac, secure the corridor in case they get past us. V-Deck Zira moved to take her position next to the bedroom compartment door. She entered her security override code, and hovered her finger over the enter key waiting for Lucius to ring the bell so that the noise would cover the opening of her door. Nodding in acknowledgement, Lucius buzzed the doorbell, the chime covering the slight swish of the bedroom door as the V-deck moved inside. He buzzed several more times before pressing the intercom. Open up in there, we know that you are aboard. He kept an eye on the data feed and noticed the two life signs moving into the office space in agitation. Fine, he thought. We'll do it the hard way. Motioning to Tarlac that he was going in and receiving a nod in response, he entered his own security override code and entered the palatial quarters of the Prime and his mate. Before him was an open plan living dining and kitchen area. To the left were two compact bedrooms and a bathroom, where he knew the V-deck was waiting. To the right was an office and a large conference room, as well as a small prayer room dedicated to the goddess. While the quarters on this colony ship were generally larger than most he had travelled in, as they were designed to be deconstructed to provide individual living pods, this was palatial compared to the small pods the other members of the delegation had been assigned. Come out, ladies. I'm aware that you are in the office. There is no point hiding any further. His voice was edged with irritation as he tried to control his hunting instincts, and he silently cursed as two girls stepped forward. They appeared in their early teens and wore identical white silk gowns edged in gold braid, 
with elaborately dressed hair and wide silver filigree torques around their shoulders. Sweet goddess, they were Maman La. This was going to end very, very badly. Who are you to order us, warrior? The girl on the right intoned in a glacial voice, managing to convey with her bearing that against all biological evidence, he was in fact a bug under her shoe. Her gaze was blatantly challenging as she peered down her nose at him. Ladies, he offered conversationally, did you know that on many ships they kill stowaways as a matter of course? The girls crouched defensively, preparing to attack. That wouldn't do. He would be executed if the girls attacked and he was forced to harm them in self-defence. He decided to take another tack, consciously relaxing his stance, portraying arrogant laziness and insolence. Do you have any idea of the jeopardy or contagions that you may have brought on board with you? The girl on the left gasped, while the one who had first spoken spluttered with indignation at his suggestion. We are not sick or unclean in any way, how dare you? He shook his head at them and motioned towards the door. Come on, ladies, the cadet awaits. As one, they glared at him before regally stepping into the corridor. He heard Tarlac's quick inhale at the sight of them and watched them both preen at his low bow. The one on the right, who he had mentally named Trouble, sniffed again. At least someone around here has manners. She turned to move up the corridor in the wrong direction, coming to an abrupt stop as the V-deck stepped into view from her concealed position in the bedroom doorway. Other way! She motioned towards the large airlock at the end of the corridor that led to the central trunk of the ship. The girls looked at each other again, and as one turned their back on her in dismissal and glided towards the airlock, over their heads, Zira raised an eyebrow in inquiry at Lucius, while Tarlac jumped to open the door for the girls and escort them. Trouble gave him a winning smile and gently patted his arm, which caused him to blush to the roots of his hair. The girls moved to take an arm each as he propelled them through the labyrinth of ship corridors towards the meeting rooms. What is going on? Zira muttered quietly to Lucius as he fell into step beside her. They don't appear to be your typical stowaways, he sighed deeply. Trouble. This only means trouble. She continued to stare at him expectantly before he let out another gusty sigh, ignoring a reprimanding look from the quiet one. If I am right, this is a bag of thyssen landing in our lap. Those girls are Maman La. He took in the V-deck's blank expressions. Maman in training probably phrased students, for her to have brought them aboard without approval. He looked bleak. There will be a lot of trouble over this, he finished again somewhat lamely. Zira frowned, still confused. I don't understand, they're stowaways. We lock them into stasis to prevent any contagion and ship them back on the first homeward transport when we get there. While it's annoying, it's hardly that big of a problem. You don't understand. The Mammon Convocation are the ultimate law on Verit. They control everything. The Prime does not have the authority to override his mate. He can't order them home without her approval. If she has done this with the permission of the Council, then he can't send them back. Zira raised her eyebrow again. He noticed she did that a lot. The Kadek is not subject to your laws. She will never condone stowaways in her colony, let alone whatever contagion they could have brought. He sighed. Like I said, trouble. In one stroke, the planetary co-sponsors will be in disagreement, and the Mammon Convocation will have established their first step in controlling this colony as well. The Videx snorted. Then they don't know the Kadek very well. I just hope the girls have had the sense to take the Colonial General Vaccine, Protein Process Enhancers and Immune Alteration Agents. The last thing we need is them dying of some foreign bug before we can ship them home. Lucius hesitated. Those young girls are very important people on my world, or at least they will be. Their disappearance will not go unnoticed. They are used to complete obedience, even reverence. If anything were to happen to them, there would be severe repercussions. Their hushed conversation came to an end as they approached the cadet's office. Tarlac pulled the girls to a half before the doorway, and Lucia stepped ahead into the room and motioned them in. Wait out here, Tarlac. The young officer nodded and took up position outside the door, occasionally sneaking surreptitious glances at the girls. Ladies! Zira indicated the girls to precede her into the room. Lucius bowed before the cadet, pointedly ignoring the maman, which did not go unnoticed. She stared daggers at him. He could not bring himself to look at her with even his usual cool detachment, could not contain his anger that her stupid, selfish act could put this opportunity for his males in jeopardy. Governor, we have apprehended the stowaways. 
he gestured to the girls. They were located in the Prime's quarters, as indicated on the bioscans. The cadet looked at the Prime and he raised his hands in defence. I didn't bring them. In fact, I have barely been in my quarters over the last 24 hours. They are not stowaways, the maman pronounced, enunciating each of her words with a snap as she moved to stand before the girls who visibly straightened at her presence. They are my students, and here with the endorsement and approval of the maman convocation. They are not here with mine. The cadet matched the maman's icy glare with her own calm one. As far as this ship and colony is concerned, they are stowaways. They have no designated cabins, they have no assigned role, and we do not have their genetic and immunization records on file. They are not here with my approval. In accordance with the Planetary Co-Sponsoring Agreement, Article 5, Part B, as governor of this colony, all migrating colonists during the first 100 years of establishment require my endorsement. Bringing two additional females into a colony of this size at its inception could seriously offset the balance in our group. The Mammon Convocation does not require your approval or endorsement. Frey raised her chin in challenge. This planet is ours. We are entitled to selection rights over our representatives. The cadet maintained her calm. You had selection rights when you chose your first colonists, which we endorsed. However, you are not on Verit anymore and you have no authority here. You seem to have conveniently forgotten that your people signed an agreement with mine that we would fund, administer and operate the colony. Without us, you would be sitting pretty on Verit with ownership of a planet with no infrastructure, no colony ship and no alliance approval to establish habitation. We already have a surfeit of females in this initial group, and we jointly agreed that no one under 21 would be included in the initial group from either side. The maman paled at this response and opened her mouth to retort while the cadet continued on over her, to the obvious shock of the girls. These girls are not approved colonists. They shall be immediately brought to medical so that a full screening may be performed. If they have not undertaken the required medical clearances, we may need to perform a full decontamination of the ship and re-clear everyone through medical. Lucius groaned internally. That was going to take days. The Verit homeworld shall be contacted to secure immediate transport. If for any reason the Verit homeworld is unable or unwilling to manage their relocation, they shall be placed in stasis and transported to Felosia to await onward transport to Verit at a convenient time. The maman hissed. How dare contradict me! I am Maman Frey, leader of the Dathalka clan. I have decreed and so it will be. The girls stay. These are the flowers of Verit. They are not unclean or diseased. How dare you treat them so? She gathered a girl under each arm protectively. The Maman convocation shall hear of this. Brun, you and your males are ordered to protect and defend us. He turned his eyes to the goddess in prayer. I am sorry, my lady, but respectfully I cannot follow your order. The Kadek is right, you have put me in a very difficult position, and these girls' very lives in jeopardy. Without a complete genetic screening, they could be harbouring medical issues that would not have presented a problem on Verit, but which could make them incompatible to Colony 29. My responsibility for the safety of Verit females overrides you in this instance. I cannot allow you to put them in jeopardy. Furthermore, I am under orders from the Matriarch Ray to obey the dictates of the appointed governor, the maman grit her teeth in frustration. I am not an imbecile. Of course they undertook genetic screening, she retorted. I would not have jeopardized their lives. A screening which you did not share with us. Tell me, how did you acquire the necessary protein process enhancers and immune cocktails? They were specifically designed for this planet over many months of research. Testing and refinement and dosages were strictly controlled. The cadet's voice was harsh. We did not. We synthesized an agent from our analysis of the biological records available on the planet. I see. So you don't actually know if you have properly acclimatized them to the planet. If they did not receive the correct cocktail of medication, they will starve rather quickly as they will be unable to ingest or process any of the native flora and fauna. We took every precaution. Except the ones you should have. The cadet's voice was final. You have flouted my authority, breached the agreement your people have signed placed these children's lives in danger and caused untold disruption to our schedule since we may now have to conduct a full decontamination. My orders stand. They shall go to medical, then into custody to be sent home at the first opportunity. Zira, take them into custody and inform the chief healer. Zira stepped forward to take Trouble's arm. 
only to find her turning with unexpected speed to strike at the pressure point on her elbow. Only the VDEX years of training prevented the girl's blow from causing injury, as she stepped back sharply and brought her own arm around in a blurring motion to trap the girl's arm, as she pressed her face first into the nearby cabin wall. The cabin erupted into chaos. What? Unhand her! Let her go! Be silent! The cadet commanded, her voice cutting over the hubbub. I also add attempted assault to my charges against these girls. Zira peeled the spitting, hissing girl off the wall. Shall I post guards, ma'am? The cadet nodded as she took in the girl's demeanour. From the Felotian security delegation. She cocked an eye at the prime who nodded in agreement. It seems your little flowers have thorns, maman. Any more surprises for us? The secrets of the maman convocation are not for a Bax Thatcher like you to know. The maman spat at the cadet as she held protectively to the other girl, who still had not said a word during the entire display. Lucius flinched. Wars had been started between clans for less insult. When females warred, males died. The cadet smiled tightly. I am unfamiliar with that word, although one assumes it is not normally used in polite company. Do not mistake my forbearance in this matter for weakness. I could easily have these girls executed as a danger to the colony, or you arrested for bringing on stowaways. It is only my desire to form a working partnership with your people that holds me back. Make no mistake, I will do so in a heartbeat if you, or they, jeopardise this colony. The cadet moved to stand behind her desk and tapped her datapad to open the office door. You are ordered to go with them to the med bay and give Danara any assistance and information she requires in determining just what cocktail you have cooked up to give these girls for their immune systems. The Prime stepped up to his mate and offered a hand to the quiet girl who was trembling in fear and had visibly paled at the suggestion of execution. Go with the V-deck. No one will harm you if you do as you are told. Unfortunately, the outcome of this little escapade is probably several months of a long, boring trip for you. He looked at his mate, who turned her back to him in dismissal. He sighed heavily. Zira pulled Trouble towards the door. As it opened, Trouble screeched again. Tarlac, assist me, I'm being assaulted. Tarlac turned in shock, clearly torn between assisting the girl and manhandling his new colleague, also a female. Stand down, warrior, Lucius barked. Assist me. We will escort the Mammon and Mammon Lass to medical with the V-deck until we can figure out something more permanent. The entire motley lot exited the office and there was a moment of silence. The Prime crossed to a decanter on a sideboard and held up a glass to the Kedek in offering, and she nodded. He sipped his drink before he spoke. Well, that went well. The Kedek's voice was carefully neutral. You put me in a difficult position, Prime. I could have used your support. I know. And I'm sorry, Kadek, but the Maman have complete authority on Verit. In this particular case, you actually had more authority than I had. He paused, contemplating the amber liquid in the decanter. The Maman convocation is a large part of why many of our males wish to leave Verit. They are tired of being ruled by manipulation. They seek a new way of life, not just a new version of the old ways. However, the convocation would never have funded this expedition without a Maman along. It seems no matter how hard we try to forge a new way, we bring our old issues with us. The cadet felt sorry for him almost. We Felotian are not so different. Many of us no longer wish to live by our old ways, but there are still those of us that will not willingly bind to a male permanently, and who will struggle to see males as true partners rather than spoiled boys, only seeking their own pleasure. She strode over to him and placed a gentle hand on his shoulder. He jumped. He had clearly been lost in thought. Let us make an effort together to help them find a new way. He stared into her eyes for a moment, weighing her sincerity, before slowly nodding. They raised their glasses in salute to each other.